Good afternoon, everyone. We have a shorter run of show today, which may be more typical moving forward, depending on current events. On the COVID front, things continue to move in the right direction, with hospitalizations continuing to trend downward. Mr. Pichek is away today, so Dr. Levine will hit the highlights. And due to yesterday's holiday, the um, full modeling presentation will be posted on the DFR website tomorrow. Next, this week, members of the House and Senate are continuing to meet in a, at a, in a conference committee to resolve their differences on the budget adjustment bill. And I'm hoping they address some of the issues that I have as well. As a reminder, BAA usually contains pretty modest changes, but this year, given the unprecedented amount of federal money, as well as upgrades in state revenues, we have an opportunity to address some important issues right now. And because BAA can appropriate money earlier in the session, rather than waiting until the next fiscal year, beginning July 1, we can invest in urgent and immediate needs right now. That's why the budget adjustment I originally proposed included over 15 million for healthcare workers, given the significant workforce shortage we're experiencing. And while housing has been a priority of mine since I came to office, the need today is even more urgent, which is why I asked the legislature to take half of this session's $145 million housing package and put it in budget adjustment because we could and should begin this work now. And the 75 million I originally proposed in budget adjustment would help tremendously. Unfortunately, the money we asked for to address the middle income housing was stripped out by the House. And more concerning, 20 million more was removed in the Senate version. So we're hoping the conference committees recognizes the urgent need we have and puts the money back in. I also have concerns about how the current bill spends American Rescue Plan Act funds. Last year, after we received historic funding, I was clear that this one-time money must be used on tangible, transformative initiatives. Specifically, I ask that the funding be dedicated to housing, climate change, water and sewer infrastructure, as well as broadband. In last year's budget, the legislature appeared to agree and pass intent language in the budget stating that this is where the money should go. At the time, we agreed because we knew we needed to have a clear vision and a plan for how to use this funding in order to get the most value out of this once in a lifetime opportunity. It's important we don't change course now and water down the incredible impact we could have in every county of the state. We can't bend to pressure and spend it piecemeal without thinking about the big picture. Unfortunately, the BAA currently uses the federal ARPA funding where surplus general funds could be used instead. Now, I'm sure this may sound like nitpicking to some, but this would be like taking money out of your savings account to pay your electric bill when you're still getting a paycheck every single week. I realize the legislature isn't going to agree with everything I put forward but I laid out a plan for the entire pot of ARPA money, and I haven't seen one from them, at least not yet. Spending ARPA money in the BAA without having a road map, map sets us up to miss out on an important opportunity when the final budget is crafted. It may lead to not having the money we hope to have for these big investments. As I've said, I know legislators have their own ideas in addition to what I've proposed and I do appreciate the areas where we overlap, but we've got to get this right. Before putting hundreds of millions of dollars out the door, we need to know where we're going so we don't squander this moment in time. My team will continue to communicate with the committees. Over the, few, over the last few weeks, we've laid out where we'd like to see the BAA investments go to get the best results for Vermonters. Secretary Clouser is here to walk us through our concerns so with that, uh, Secretary Clouser. Thank you, Governor. 
Good afternoon. The Budget Adjustment Act is a traditional document which in a typical year includes dozens of accounting adjustments and net neutral changes with anywhere between three and $10 million in appropriations. This year, the BAA is quite different than a typical year in size, scope, and importance. Total appropriations exceed 200 million in this BAA, and the bill contains critical proposals and key issues for Vermonters. Because of that, as the governor indicated in his remarks, it is more important than ever to invest wisely in the BAA, to make the most of the historic level of federal recovery and state surplus money. This afternoon, and likely throughout the rest of the week, members of the House and Senate Conference Committees will meet to discuss the BAA. The legislature has spent significant time on this bill, and the administration appreciates those efforts and the fact that we have many shared priorities. Despite those shared priorities, however, we continue to have concerns about how decisions made now will impact Vermont's future vision. So I wanted to take this opportunity to elevate some of our greatest concerns, which relate to ARPA funding and putting the opportunity to build resiliency and lower statewide debt at risk. The BAA, currently before the conference committee, invests substantial ARPA funds without considering the larger economic revitalization needs of the state or maximizing the value of this money. The House amendment to the BAA results in over 106 million in new net ARPA spending, and the Senate amendment spends 114 more ARPA funds, which is 84 million more than the governor's version. Further, the legislature directs many of those ARPA funds outside of the five spending categories agreed upon by the legislature and the governor last year. Housing, climate change mitigation, water sewer, wastewater infrastructure, broadband, and economic recovery. In total, legislative changes to the BAA reduce available ARPA from 508 million to 423 million, a 17% reduction. That's almost equal to the total appropriation to broadband in the governor's FY23 ARPA budget. It exceeds the total appropriation to water and sewer projects in the budget. And perhaps most importantly, as the governor mentioned, the legislature has made these significant cuts without providing a vision or roadmap as to how or if they plan to fund these essential infrastructure projects in the future. We appreciate the Senate adding waterfall language, which would allow a portion of this ARPA funding to be recaptured if there was a surplus at the end of the fiscal year. But even this construct only allows for a recapture of approximately 34% of the additional ARPA funds allocated by the Senate. So while this is certainly a step in the right direction, the surplus construct continues to place ARPA funding at risk and does not adequately address the administration's primary concern with the use of ARPA dollars for short-term programmatic needs. The investments the legislature makes with these ARPA funds may be worthy efforts, but they do not maximize the return on investment or accelerate Vermont's economic recovery. The infrastructure projects proposed by the governor are critical, and they are expensive. That is why they have not been done, and they might never be done if we fail to direct these resources to once-in-a-generation investments. In addition to concerns about the way ARPA funds are being allocated in this year's BAA, the administrative proposals to pay off state debt are put at risk in the current version of the bill. Several proposals in the governor's BAA were designed to improve the state's financial standing now and into the future. The governor, with the support of the treasurer's office, proposed to retire 20 million general obligation bonds. In addition to the benefits received from interest savings, 
This sends an unmistakable message to our creditors, the credit rating agencies, that financial sustainability is a top priority for government leaders. The House declined to fund this priority. The Senate put it into waterfall language in the event of a surplus. We asked the committee to restore it outright. The administration also requests the legislature to fund the governor's initiative to close the property management internal service fund deficit. This deficit, currently $21 million, has been on the state's balance sheet for almost two decades. There's a plan to close half of it, but there's no plan to, to close the remaining 10 million. The governor's budget adjustment included the full 10 million. The House cut it in half. The Senate put the remaining half into surplus waterfall language, but we ask it to be restored in full. This is not the kind of investment and initiative that gets top billing when money is tight, but it should be a prime consideration before funds are allocated to new programs or new services, which may not be sustainable in future years. Similarly, the governor's budget adjustment put $6.7 million towards bolstering our state liability fund. We are pleased the Senate restored this funding in full and urged the conference committee to retain all $6.7 million in the BAA. We should be putting more money aside in this area to build resiliency, not less. In conclusion, the administration is asking the committee specifically to adhere to prior commitments included in last year's budget to continue using ARPA funds for high value transformational infrastructure projects, including housing, clean water, climate action, broadband, and economic revitalization in every county in Vermont to remove ARPA-funded proposals for short-term needs from the BAA. These one-time programmatic needs could be better supported through general fund dollars. And finally, to restore in full the funding for the governor's proposals to reduce the state's debt, close long-standing deficits, and generate future savings for Vermonters. Thank you, and I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. Since Commissioner Pichek isn't here today, I'm going to start with just a few slides that he normally presents. And these, as you'll see, will continue to reinforce the improving picture of COVID-19 here in Vermont. The Department of Financial Regulation slide deck will be available at DFR's COVID-19 modeling website as usual. So here on the first slide, we can see that Vermont is now averaging 220 cases over the last seven days, which is a 28% decrease over the previous week and 44% over the past 14 days. As the slide shows, cases have come down a dramatic 88% since the Omicron peak. In terms of hospitalizations, the rate of new hospitalizations have stabilized. And we saw a 20% decrease in patients hospitalized with COVID-19 over the previous week, a trend that we expect will continue in the coming weeks. Notably, the number of Vermonters in the ICU for COVID has dropped by a third, the lowest level since last October. On this morning's count, first time in a long time we've seen the number in the ICU below 10 at 8. Regarding fatalities, we have mourned 587 COVID-related deaths with an additional four reported over the past four days. I'm somewhat heartened by the fact that this grim aspect of the virus also appears to be trending down. COVID-19 fatalities are lower in February so far, but we're not sure yet where that number will end up as this metric takes the longest to reflect the impact of improving case numbers. Nonetheless, as we continue to watch these downward trajectories, 
we can see where we are headed, which is a time of less transmission and disease in our state. That's why we are looking forward, planning for deliberate and phased transitions in the future. You may have seen other states beginning to make the same types of decisions and plans, moving toward recovery as we collectively accept that this no longer new virus is here to stay. We'll continue to integrate current case and serious outcome data, wastewater surveillance monitoring, modeling projections, and Vermont's continually increasing and high vaccination rate to slowly map out how we can live safely while COVID-19 remains a lesser overall threat. The data that we discuss here and that you can find on our web pages allows us to see trends and make projections about future planned actions and mitigation measures. Much like the governor's recent announcement about masks in schools had a start date two weeks after the announcement. It allows us to think about our future efforts related to things like testing, a Herculean effort by so many teams throughout the pandemic especially recently as we pivoted, pivoted to distribution of take-home tests around the holidays and then to schools and childcare programs on a regular basis. As we see a decrease in demand for testing at our PCR test sites around the state, we are assessing how much will still be needed and where take-home tests can better meet the needs of Vermonters. These self-tests are more convenient and provide quicker results. They help those who test positive to isolate more quickly, thereby reducing the potential for further spread. And when virus transmission decreases, Vermonters will not need to get tested as often, such as before and after social gatherings, as overall risk will be much lower. As we move forward in our planning, we will gradually shift toward fewer broad-based public health recommendations to a more individualized approach based on one's own circumstances and health needs. This will mean a strategy that is based on how we all have different levels of risk and will need to navigate them and manage precautions in our own way at our own pace. Considering our own individual risk will become part of our own decision making. Decisions to translate into our routine daily day-to-day -day acts to protect ourselves and the people around us. I understand that it has been and will continue to be harder for people who are at higher risk of more severe illness, and we cannot leave behind these Vermonters and anyone who faces personal, historical, or cultural health equity challenges. Within our communities, we will all need to understand a person's need to take extra precautions and support their needs. Remember, the person who wears a mask has their own good reasons to do so, and we need to respect their reasoning and be understanding. As mask policies evolve, we cannot let wearing a mask become a political statement or cause for dividing us. We will focus our public health efforts on protecting those at higher risk by making sure they are up to date on vaccines and have access to testing and treatment to help prevent the worst outcomes. Now, in this planning for the future, we do need to expect, expect new variants of the virus. Some variants may emerge and disappear while others persist. One of these, a subvariant of the Omicron virus, BA2, is causing concern in some parts of the world and has been found in 47 states, including Vermont. We are still learning a lot about this variant and any possible impact on transmissibility and severity, and there is not yet any definitive word. However, keep noting that case counts are going down, so it's certainly not increasing in vast proportions. We will continue to follow the real-time data on BA2. Even though variants may pose new challenges in the future, we will continue to use sequencing, monitoring, and surveillance, and our experience and knowledge of the virus to minimize any threats as much as we can. I'd like to reflect for a moment on how hard these past two years have been, especially on certain groups of people. 
In a new study from the CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, we see yet another example of the toll the pandemic has taken on children's mental health. It found that during the pandemic, girls aged 12 to 17 had more emergency department visits for some mental health conditions, including eating and tick disorders, depression and anxiety. Our own Vermont data from 2021 also indicates higher rates for females 10 to 24 than other age groups for emergency department visits related to suicidality. That is what we mean when we say our kids are not all right and why we are working to refocus on issues like these as we balance the presence of COVID in our lives with all of our other needs. And please be sure that young females and anyone who may be in crisis know that help is available. Text VT to 741741 and a counselor will respond. This pandemic has been tough on all of us, both physically and emotionally. And now we are facing yet another time of uncertainty as we slowly make our way toward a more normal way of life. I'll share some simple advice from our mental health safety officer at VDH, who is supporting our teams in the COVID-19 response. Be aware of how the pandemic has impacted you and consider these effects as you think about your future plans. Each of us will transition back to normal routines at a different pace. Try not to take on too much too fast. Be open and flexible to the changes ahead as we look to the future with hope. On a similar note, I know some parents and caregivers of children under age five are still anxious about the risks of COVID-19 and eager to have their child protected by vaccine. I and others in public health and healthcare are glad the vaccine will get more time needed to review data on a third dose. The doses being studied are much smaller and it is common for young children to need multiple doses of a vaccine to get a big enough benefit. But I know how hard it is to have an end in sight, only to be told the wait will be a bit longer. The good news is we are still planning ahead and engaging our pediatric provider community to have the vaccine ready to be given once it is reviewed and authorized by federal regulators. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. I haven't spoken to Christina, but uh, I was very pleased to see her step up. Um, she's a viable candidate. Uh, she has a wealth of experience and uh, the right demeanor, and it should be an interesting race. So no plans on whether you will? Oh, I, I mean, I, I supported myself and uh, Senator Leahy. Uh, uh, work together to appoint her uh, to, as U.S. Attorney, so I have no doubt that I'll be supporting her. The town meeting day break is, is next week, and we've got uh, crossover week. Have you moved any closer to making a decision of whether you'll run or not? I have not. Real. Just before this press conference, we got the notice that you did decide to veto the legislature, legislatures, excuse me, gun bill, um, you issued a, a statement, but can you explain here your decision to do that and why you came to that conclusion? Yeah, as everyone probably recalls, back in 2018, we made historic changes to our gun laws. Uh, they included expanded background, uh, background checks, uh, red flag laws, uh, a ban on, on high capacity magazines and, and many other provisions uh, that many people, many Vermonters, um, haven't become accustomed to and know that they're there. I believe that we need an opportunity to make sure that we're educating Vermonters, uh, to tell them what's in there before we change and make any further adjustments. But having said all that, I mean, I am sensitive uh, to the so-called uh, Charleston loophole. I'm not sure if it's really a loophole. It was put there intentionally by Congress 
uh, back when uh, the Brady Bill was enacted. Uh, and it was put there, uh, I believe, uh, to make sure that government reacted uh, accordingly and put this on the front burner and made sure that the background uh, checks were done in an expeditious fashion. Again, I am sensitive that things have gotten complicated um, and we need to make sure that we're not uh, providing an opportunity for uh, people to get guns when they shouldn't have them. So if they're on, if there's any question, uh, they may need a little bit more time. But I don't believe, I, mean, I, think it's, I think it's excessive to go from three days, three business days as it currently is, to 30 days. Uh, and as well, uh, during that time, the applications run out in 30 days. So if someone is buying a gun, um, they have to fill out an application. It goes through the NICS system. And, uh, and under this uh, proposed law, uh, if they didn't, hadn't made a decision in 30 days, the applicant would have to make out another application. They could get stuck in this, uh, this uh, vicious uh, cycle, so to speak. So, I think uh, there, there's an opportunity for us to work together. I provided the why in my, and for anyone who hasn't read the veto message as I do typically, I want to explain why I vetoed it, but I also want to provide a path forward if possible. And in this case, I thought uh, instead of uh, uh, going from three days to 30 days to give them a little bit more time, uh, possibly going from three days to seven business days. Uh, which should be provided enough opportunity for the federal government to go through a background check to be sure that we're not putting guns in the hands of people who shouldn't have them. Is that explained enough? Yes. Okay. Governor, I, I also wanted to ask about your concerns with budget adjustment that, that you mentioned. Um, you know, it sounds like you, you've got some, some concerns of, of how lawmakers are spending some of this money. Should Whatever comes out of conference committee, should they not address concerns? I mean, would you consider vetoing uh, the, the bill? Well, we'll see where we end up. Again, I don't, uh, I don't try to overuse the threat of veto, but I have concerns. I just want them to, to at least have a seat at the table and not ignore some of our concerns um, because I have a vote too. So, um, again, suffice it to say, this isn't what I thought we had agreed to in the last uh, budget cycle. Uh, that was, there was intent language in the budget uh, to focus ARPA funds on these buckets, whether it's in broadband or water sewer infrastructure or climate change mitigation or housing. Those were the main initiatives and I wanna make sure that we're spending in the right place because if we, if we take and spend the ARPA money uh, on pr programmatic needs, for instance, we just won't have the money left when we, when we go to the final budget. So where are we going to take it out of? I mean, it's not a, an endless pot of money. So are we going to have less housing? Are we going to have less uh, broadband? Are we going to have less water, sewer, and storm infrastructure? Uh, are we going to have less uh, climate change mitigation steps? We have to make choices then. So let's, uh, as difficult as it is, let's focus on the fundamentals and make sure we get this right. Secretary Clauser, anything you want to add? Okay. I just had maybe one clarification. It might be for Secretary Clauser, but um, I understand in BAA there is some money for the uh, general assistance hotel motel program. Should this not be worked out by March 1st? Because I understand that's when it expires. What, what happens then? Yeah, the from what I understand, and uh, this might be a question for Secretary Samuelson, but from what I understand, um, FEMA is going to extend that to March 31. So we will, uh, if there's money available from FEMA, we will extend it as well. But I'll let Secretary Samuelson answer. So housing is a major concern for us and, and really working to ensure that individuals are able to transition from, tra to, from the hotels to transitional housing to permanent housing. Um, what will happen in the next couple of um, weeks is that we will extend the current GA housing program through the using the weather provisions through the end of um, the month to March 31st. Um, that gives us time to work on getting the emergency rental um, housing assistance program up and going, which will allow us to, to work with individuals to transition from GA 
to transitional housing where we believe that they will get better services um, and the supports that they need to eventually transition through the governor's investments to the more permanent housing options that are going to become available to them. Um, it is important though to note that in order to make that transition from the um, current program to the ERAP program that the Title IX provision in the BAA is essential in order for us to have enough housing to make that transition. So the number we found in our own sequencing is less than 10, <clears throat> but I just got a report from uh, CDC that I get weekly. It's unfortunately the experience through January 29th, so it doesn't include February. There we had about 2.8% delta and about 96% the traditional BA1 Omicron, which leaves hardly any, but you know, one or two percent maximum of the BA2. And it's BA2 or BA2? BA2. BA2, I see. Um, what is the experience like with that variant? Is it more severe symptoms than Omicron, than Delta? We don't believe so, but it really is not definitively known yet. Uh, we're looking at experience around the world and around the country, but there just isn't that much experience. So I would be hesitant to say anything on either side of the equation, except that it does seem to be a little more transmissible, perhaps 1.4 times more transmissible than the traditional Omicron. So it can affect a few more people, but doesn't seem to be more severe for what we know now. And I'm just very heartened by the fact that we're not seeing it um, expand in a major way here in Vermont. Uh, while we're finding it, our case counts and everything else, uh, hospitalizations are going down. Dr. Levine, while you're at the podium, it turns out the CDC uh, was not publishing a significant amount of data on booster effectiveness, hospitalizations, things of the like. Has that raised any concerns for you and, and has Vermont now been making decisions based off of unreleased data that the CDC has had? Or? Yeah, so I, I don't want to uh, throw my dagger into the chest of the CDC on top of the New York Times and others. I mean, the reality is the CDC has a tremendous amount of data. Um, they don't publish it all quickly. They do try to put it through a fair scientific review process. And the reality is, and they will admit this as quickly as I will, uh, they, they need severe data modernization for which a lot of federal money is now being allocated. So that's part of it. Um, Vermont, though, you may recall throughout this pandemic, uh, we haven't relied 100% on CDC. We've relied on our own data and we've relied on our own trends and um, plus the understanding of the science, which comes from CDC but comes from you know, literature around the world and uh, the scientific research community. So we've tried to be very integrative in how we approach things. So this announcement by the New York Times, um, you know, it's, it doesn't look good for the CDC, but at the same time, um, it doesn't impact how we utilize data or how we view the CDC. And plenty of what they have published has been very useful for us. Thank you. And Governor Scott, final question for you. I don't have a lot here. Um, it turns out that legislators over the past couple of years have been using the private chat fun function in Zoom um, to have private conversations during their proceedings that were not archived or made public uh, for folks to see. What are your thoughts on that, especially when it's when these Zoom meetings have been touted as being more transparent because people can log in to YouTube and, and otherwise, but it turns out these conversations have been happening out of the public eye. Well, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt that this is new territory uh, for the legislature uh, and having at least the proceedings uh, be visible to anyone who wants to log in is a step in the right direction. I think uh, um, they have many opportunities to be uh, more transparent in a lot of uh, what they do. And um, as we have done in the executive branch, uh, 
for instance, we have a code of ethics, uh, and and uh, and we have to respond uh, to all of your requests, uh, your FOIA requests, and so forth. The legislature does not. Um, so, again, we we want to make sure that we set the mark, set the tone, and um, but I think uh, in this day and age, I think everything should be uh, be able to be FOIA'd. Right. Uh, as well, I wanted to go back to the uh, the S30. Um, yeah, I meant to mention that uh, S30 would have gone uh, been enacted uh, in July, July one. So there is an opportunity. Uh, regardless, uh, they weren't going to uh, put this into uh, this wouldn't have been put into place before July one. So this gives us an opportunity to work between now and then uh, for resolution. Okay. All right, we'll move to the phone. Starting with Wilson Ring, AP. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you, as always. Governor, I think you might have been asked this question, but I heard your answer but couldn't hear the question. Uh, when, are, when are we going to hear about your political plans? That, that, that was a question by Calvin, so you'll have to ask him. <laughs> he, he was asking the same question, though. So I, um, sometime during this legislative session, I will make my plans known. Okay, fair enough. And secondly, I have a question for uh, Dr. Levine about the switch from uh, pandemic, and he didn't use the term endemic, but I'm curious, is that going to be a, uh, you know, on one day we're still in pandemic mode and then it switches to this endemic mode that you were describing, or is this something that's going to happen gradually? This is going to be a gradual transition, but I would suspect it'll be over what? weeks to a short number of months, not like a prolonged transition. And I think, you know, endemic is a fine term, and I've described it and defined it before, but too many people see the three letters E-N-D, and that's not the implication of endemic, that, you know, it's the end of everything, COVID's over, you know, go back to completely normal. It really is meant to imply that we coexist with the virus in a very new way, in a very plausible way, uh, and it becomes like other respiratory viruses that we live with every year, year after year. It seems a couple of months ago you were looking toward late winter or early spring, maybe sometime in March for this. Uh, do you think that is uh, fair? I think that's completely realistic. Okay, thank you very much. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Page. Hello, Governor. Sorry, I'm sitting in my throat. Uh, Governor, <coughs> I, I beg your pardon. <coughs> the uh, Department of Homeland Security issued a bulletin on February 7th declaring that people who are um, Americans who are online critics of government policy on COVID 19 and election fraud and 5G technology are, quote unquote, domestic threat actors. And that Department of Homeland Security will be working with, with its public and private partners, including state and local governments, to uh, address this, this problem that it claims. And I'm wondering if you've heard about this and if you have any plans to cooperate with DHS on identifying uh, so-called threat actors in Vermont who are online critics of these uh, government policies. I have not. Uh, I've not seen that guy. And uh, I was on a, a call with the Department of Homeland Security last week, and I don't recall mm. anything of that nature on the call. So I'm mm. not aware of anything. I mean, if we're well, it's a bulletin right, right on the website. Uh -huh. uh, up there for all to see. Uh, if we start taking I, uh, uh, if we start taking action against online critics, it's going to be a, a long, long road of any sort. Yeah. I mean, of yeah. any subject. So I, it, right. it doesn't sound right to me. But again, I'll we'll take a look. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you. 
Aaron Patanko, BT Digger. Hi, um, I have a question about corrections, and I understand that someone from the Department of Corrections isn't in the queue um, today, but maybe uh, Governor Scott and maybe um, Secretary Samuelson might be able to comment. Um, you know, we've, we've, even as cases have declined statewide, we continue to see pretty large outbreaks in corrections facilities, including, I believe it was 45 people testing positive over the weekend at Springfield. Um, what kind of approach is the state taking to tackling specifically Omicron in these kind of facilities? Yeah, I, might, I, I don't think we've let our guard down uh, in terms of our uh, correctional facilities, and uh, I was somewhat surprised. But at the same time, um, this is a highly transmittable uh, variant. And uh, so when it comes uh, and gets uh, centered in one congregate setting, it, uh, it does go like wildfire. Uh, so um, I'm, I, I guess in some respects, um, I'm surprised in other respects I'm not, um, but, uh, but I'm grateful that uh, none of the cases seems to be um, severe. Uh, so uh, just because they have COVID, as we've seen with this uh, particular variant, uh, doesn't mean uh, that they will have uh, um, experienced any severe conditions, uh, especially if they've, been, uh, if they've been vaccinated. Now, we do have... Um, I, not all of the population has been uh, vaccinated. It's been offered in the, uh, and we continue to offer it in the correctional facilities, but that, um, that's been a problem uh, throughout the last couple of years. Secretary Samuelson? Or Dr. Levine, one of the two or both? Thank you, Governor. Um, the governor's absolutely right. The, we've kept the COVID-related protocols in place, um, which means that there are things like quarantine and isolation for people who are coming in and out of the facility or who, who are positive for COVID. Um, these have been essential throughout the pandemic. Um, we, with Springfield, we are not seeing anyone who has uh, severe symptoms at this time. Um, but due to the nature of Omicron, it does spread um, more quickly and can come in with staff or can come in with, with uh, inmates who are, or incarcerated individuals who are um, new to the facility. Um, we do expect uh, to begin the process of looking at our COVID-related protocols. We know that it's had a significant drain on our mental health of our staff and of the individuals who we serve, um, but we'll do it thoughtfully. And as it's a congregate setting, it's likely one of the last settings that we'll begin to see the protocols um, completely removed. And instead, we'll see a phased process that will allow us to move forward um, and move back when we, when we have um, outbreaks in our, in our settings in, the, um, in our DOC facilities. Yeah, so, you know, those kind of facility-wide lockdowns that can occur mm -hmm. when people start reporting cases at the facility, is that something that you still anticipate will be a part of the strategy for combating COVID, or is there a hope for kind of more, I don't know, le less restrictive approach to combating the virus? I think that you'll see a phased approach um, as we move forward. Uh, what you'll see is that when we have a, fa a facility-wide um, outbreak, we may still be in a position where we're going to need to have um, facility-wide lockdowns. But um, in the phased approach, and again, it's still in the process of being vetted um, and designed um, in partnership with the Department of Health and Corrections together, I think you'll see a more targeted um, approach when there's a single case um, or a small cluster of cases um, where it may not be facility-wide lockdown, but instead a much more targeted um, intervention. We just need, okay. we just need to get I also, there. Yep. Um, I also had heard from a reader a question of what kind of enforcement do you guys have for the guards if they're found not complying with COVID protocols, such as masking? Is that something that you're familiar with? Um, I'd leave that to HR, potentially to Secretary um, Clauser, but uh, we definitely are working with uh, our employees. It's not, we aren't seeing any rampant issues um, with employees who are not um, participating in the COVID protocols. Um, but related to the specific elements, I'd turn it over to Secretary Clauser. Thank you. 
Thanks, Jenny. Sure. The, um, we have a specific disciplinary process that is used for masking violations or failure for folks to comply with masking guidance, and that's been something we've spoken to the union with, and we have agreed on that disciplinary process. So I, I can get you the specific um, process through HR, but, but it has been discussed with the union and agreed upon. Okay, thank you. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Governor, um, just want to ask uh, clearly if uh, the background check that was proposed, the time, uh, the time period uh, proposed in the bill that you just vetoed, if uh, if they changed it to seven business days and, and instead of the currently proposed one, is everything else in that bill to your acceptability? Yeah, the rest of um, the provisions in the bill. I don't believe are necessary, uh, but they aren't problematic. Um, other than uh, allowing high capacity uh, magazines come into the state for sporting events. I think that's one provision that they had uh, that uh, isn't allowed right now. Everything else uh, could be done under existing statute, but it's not problematic. Uh, the problematic piece is the uh, going from three to 30 days in terms of the time period. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Chris Roy. All right, we'll move to Tim McQuisden, uh, excuse me, Joseph Gresser, Barton Chronicle. Right now, we'll try Tim McQuiston from Rob Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Um, as you know, the the Fed is meeting in March, and it looks like they're going to raise rates by half a point, and the mortgage rates are up by about a full point since just last September. Uh, inflation's a concern, and on the other hand, the revenue report from last week was pretty good. What what's your take on inflation and the the near future anyway of the Vermont economy, given all that. I think you asked me about uh, three or four months ago, what was my biggest concern moving forward uh, with the economy? And I said inflation. And uh, I still am concerned about inflation. Um, this is, uh, we're seeing, you know, worldwide events that are going to have an effect on inflation here in the, our country. The workforce shortage is going to have an effect. Uh, as well as uh, all of the, you know, projects that we're, we're doing. We just don't have the capacity to fulfill everything that we want to do. So um, I'm still concerned uh, about that. I'm not surprised that they're um, raising the interest rate uh, to try and counter some of that, but I'm, but I'm not sure that's going to, I don't know if that's going to do it. Um, it, it doesn't seem to have had um, uh, much effect yet anyway that we're just sort of um, um there's concern on the other hand that they're raising the rates too fast will will have could put the the country into a recession and i'm wondering what what your concern yeah, was I, on that my my thoughts are as we continue to pump all kinds of federal money into the economy we have all kinds of arpa money available to us all kinds of fema money that's been coming in all of that billions of dollars here in this state uh, that has been pumped into our economy uh, creates a lot of opportunity, creates a lot of income and, and revenue. So when that starts to dry up, um, when you know uh, there's no more money being pumped in and we're having to rely on the economy itself, uh, that's when I'm, I'll start being more concerned about a recession. All right, thank you, Governor. Derek, seven days. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a couple of follow-up questions on two different topics. Uh, first, uh, going back to the governor, your uh, and, uh, support for Christina Nolan's Senate campaign, I wanted to uh, make sure I understood you 
you are are you saying you you support her uh, in a in a potential uh, general election over a, a likely Democratic challenger Peter Welch? Yeah. If so why? Yeah. Uh, again, um, I've known um, both of them for quite some time. I have a lot of respect for both of them, um, and uh, I served with uh, with Congressman Welch when he was uh, in the state Senate. And uh, we always had a great relationship, still do. Uh, but our philosophies are different. Uh, and uh, so I, uh, I'm supportive of uh, um, Christina. Now, again, I'm not sure if there's going to be any other Republicans uh, joining the race. Um, there may, I just don't know. Um, so at this point in time, with what I see, I'm, I'm supportive of having any candidate step up uh, to create a race. So. I think it's healthy uh, for our democracy. Is there is there any particular issue or, or aspect of the differing philosophies here that you would point to as um, as being decisive for you here? Well, I think we'll find that out uh, once the campaign really begins. Um, but uh, but at this point in time, again, I like uh, Christina's style. She brings uh, a lot to the table. Um, she's uh, she's energetic. Uh, she has a great background. And, uh, and, and well versed in a number of subjects. So I'm, again, I'm encouraged uh, to see a uh, candidate step up with her credentials. Uh, and then my other question is back to, back to prisons. Uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if uh, you see the state as having an obligation to uh, mitigate the cumulative effect of uh, these lockdown cycles on incarcerated people. And if so, is there is there funding uh, available or planning in the works to, to provide services to help um, mitigate that? I, I believe we have had ongoing mitigation measures uh, in our correctional facilities and will continue to do so uh, until it's safe. Um, but, um, but I'm not sure what else we can do. Uh, I'm looking for a lifeline from <laughs> either Secretary Samuelson or Dr. Levine who might be able to help. Uh, Derek, if I interpret your question correctly, I, I'm thinking you're thinking about things like um, recovery from having been through multiple lockdowns and um, having to do all the mitigation strategies that are important in COVID. So you're probably thinking about things like their access to good mental health care and health care in general, um, things of that sort, because I know there's a... Yeah significant amount of effort in that arena. I don't know if there's new money that's allocated as much as it's part of the ongoing recovery process, but Secretary Samuelson may have another detail to fill in. Yes, um, it, is a, it is something that we're considering significantly. So the, you may recall that the Department of Corrections participated in a participatory research study um, that looked at the overall impact um, of, you know, and the health of our correctional facilities. They identified um, mental health as one of those areas of focus. Um, and, what, and part of the participatory research study is really to work with the individuals who are incarcerated and the staff at that facility to design the intervention. But before that even went into place, we're working to strengthen um, both for our staff and for individuals who are incarcerated, the mental health care um, that they receive, including continuing to support the peer-to-peer um, the -peer program that Corrections has that has been very successful, um, adding additional uh, mental health counselors um, for staff um, who are also affected um, by the, the um, by the lockdowns, and then a host of other measures, which I can provide additional detail. Um, but again, I think the, part, the participation in the research study shows um, the commitment of the department, even at a very challenging time through the pandemic, um, to continue to support and improve um, the facilities and support and improve mental health. Great, thank you all. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Those of, of us in the Northeast Kingdom don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. 
Greg Lamoureux, the County Courier. Hi, Governor. Um, since we're about halfway through the legislative session, um, curious from your point of view, uh, outside of the necessary bills like the budget, What's the most critical thing that the legislature has to pass or, or has to address this year? If you could, if you could point to just one or two. You know, it, should, it really is about spending provisions and how we utilize this once in a lifetime opportunity that we have before us, uh, the billions of dollars that we have to invest in our state to help out the rural sections of the state in particular. Um, we haven't, ever had this opportunity that I know of. And uh, as I said in my remarks, we can't squander it. Um, we have to be, we have to have a vision, a plan, uh, and how we do this strategically. And uh, thus far, I haven't seen a plan from the legislature other than their intent language that they had in their, in the budget that I signed last, uh, last year. And if you haven't seen that, you should read it because it lays it out. Again, right. uh, everything that comes along uh, with that, spending the money strategically in a short period of time. So if we take, say, housing, uh, water, sewer, uh, stormwater infrastructure, even uh, climate change mitigation, broadband, so forth, um, anything that would have to go through, let's say, Act 250, uh, is a concern. Any regulatory process that we have in place right now that would slow that process down uh, to get the money uh, out and get those projects built is another, like a secondary concern, but it's, it's certainly in the mix because if we don't have, uh, if we haven't got a regulatory process that, that allows for some of these uh, projects to be built um, and we don't have the workforce either, again, uh, the workforce initiatives uh, are just as important. So it's hard to say, it's, it's like everything together uh, has to work in unison uh, in order for us to take advantage of this once in a, in a lifetime opportunity and spend the billions of dollars we have available. That's it for me. Thank you, Governor. Thanks. Andrew McGregor, Calhoun Record. Uh, yes, thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, for Dr. Levine, um, looking at uh, the, the results of the self-reported tests that the health department's begun sharing out um, on, the, on the website, the dashboard, just curious if you think the dramatic reduction in the number of test results since the beginning of January is um, uh, a reflection of the at-home test use or a, a diminishment in the, the number of results that are getting posted um, and also, if having that data available to the health department is, is even meaningful anymore, or if we're really getting to the point where new cases are, are far less important than hospitalizations and outcomes and things like that. Yeah, there's a lot in there. And as with every question, is not one answer. <clears throat> so when we look at the self-report tests, you know, through the month of January, we had, you know, some months early in the month, like uh, some weeks, I mean, three to 8,000 self-report tests. Towards the end of the month, it was down in the um, 13 to 1,500 range per week. Mixture of positives and negatives, but <clears throat> more, more negatives than positives some weeks and the flip of that other weeks. That, even those numbers, let's say we average it out to one or 2,000 a week, that doesn't account for all of the home testing we think is being done. That's but a minor fraction. Um, we can't know what fraction it is because we really don't have a good handle on how many people are doing these tests on a regular or semi-regular basis and what their results are. All we know is that the need to access our own state PCR testing sites seems to be diminishing, and uh, they're making up a smaller proportion of all of the cases as well. So the reality is um, 
I don't think cases are ever going to again represent a great way of having your finger on the pulse of the, of the uh, pandemic at this point in time. They're just another piece of data that we integrate in with everything else. You know, along with this, one thing we didn't talk about this morning is our percent positivity is now below 5%. It's in the 4.5% range. Hasn't been there in a long time, and it will continue to drop. But again, even the validity of that as a metric is challenging because you don't know the complete denominator of tests. So your last comment is really the true one, that we need to look at other indicators to really know how much of an impact this virus is having on our population at large and on our healthcare system. And hospitalizations and hospital capacity, sort of the flip side of that, uh, are really key indicators at this point in time. And that's why we're very heartened by the data that we see in the hospitals regarding COVID. We've also been reporting on a weekly basis the percentage of COVID admissions that seem to be people who actually are admitted because of COVID versus they are admitted with another condition and test positive for COVID. And the most recent number came out today and that was about 63% having COVID uh, as the reason for admission. And that's pretty steadily varied between 60 and 70%. Did I cover the answer you, in all of uh, what you asked? Yes, uh, thank you for uh, dissecting um, my multi-part question. Uh, as a quick follow-up, do you know, or does is, if Secretary French is available, whether the um, number of requests for at-home tests from school districts for the, uh, for the test at home programs, is that still steady? Is there, are they seeing a reduction in the distributions that schools need? Is, is there a way of knowing sort of the pace of testing at schools? I believe uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher is on, so um, she may be able to answer that. Yes, uh, good afternoon, thank you. Um, to my knowledge, we haven't seen any uh, m major increase or, or decline. It's been pretty steady, so I can get back to uh, you with that exact information from our team. Okay, thank you very much. Pete Hirschfeld, VPR. Pete Hirschfeld? Oh, I thought, thought I might have had you for a second. I'll try one more time. Pete? Going once. <laughs> oh, we set a new record. Um, that appears to be it, and uh, we'll uh, we'll send out a notice about next week. Town meeting day is on Tuesday, so we're not sure. We'll have a press briefing sometime during the week. But not sure if it's going to be Tuesday, but we'll send out an announcement on that uh, as soon as possible. Thank you all very much.